Well, are we asking the right questions? So it's not so important whether somebody meets some arbitrary criteria for hypermobile EDS or not. It's what's the bigger picture? So what do I mean by that? So hypermobile EDS is, as I've said, more than just being hypermobile. So what's more important is what else happens with it. So does the hypermobility, is it leading to problems? Do people have joints that sublux, that go out of place? Do they have joint pain? Do they have other joint complications? Do they have skin complications? Do they have healing problems? Do they develop hernias? Um, are there problems with the reproductive tract? And then are there problems outside of um, skeletal system issues and skin issues? So. Uh, what happens to a lot of people with EDS and hypermobility conditions is they have a cluster of problems. They can have autonomic problems, something called posture orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, getting lightheaded, having rapid heart rate. Gastrointestinal problems are very common. Migraines and other headaches are common. Trouble with the jaw, having TMJ or clenching. And having excessive allergic reactions or abnormal allergic reactions, something called mast cell activation syndrome. So if you look at people who either meet criteria for hypermobile EDS or meet criteria for hypermobility spectrum disorder, you find that most of those are very similar other than whether they meet the criteria or not. So at our center we looked at approximately 450 patients that we had seen prior to the start of the pandemic. Uh, with the pandemic, we went to a lot of video visits and some of those points that I spoke of that we would use to determine whether somebody had hypermobile EDS versus HSD, we couldn't tell some of those points over the video. But when we were seeing people in the office, we had uh, several hundred patients. And if we look at what percent in each group had POTS, what percent in each group had gastrointestinal problems, what percent in each group had mast cell activation syndrome, it was the same whether your diagnosis was hypermobility spectrum disorder or hypermobile EDS. And so to me, that tells me that we're dealing with the same problem, we just don't have good ways of definitively saying what's EDS and what's hypermobility. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Again, we don't want to go back to pre-2017 where just being hypermobile was enough to say that somebody had EDS. But let's look at these conditions. So I would envision future criteria taking into account these conditions that happen with hypermobility, like POTS, like mast cell, like gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, what else might we look at? Well. EDS or genetic conditions. So are there other people in the family? So you might qualify for a diagnosis of hypermobility spectrum disorder, but not EDS. But typically the physician who diagnoses you is seeing just you. What if they were able to see your sister, your son, your mother, your brother, your uncle? And if you had family members who meet criteria for EDS, well then that would change things. Or even if you have family members and they all meet criteria for, or many of them meet criteria for hypermobility spectrum disorder, well then we've got evidence that there's a genetic condition. So again, if you've got a sibling who's hypermobile and has POTS, you've got a parent who's hypermobile and has mast cell activation syndrome. Again, we're not just seeing a family that, you know, where hypermobility runs in the family, we're seeing a family where you know, a multi-system, a multi-faceted condition is going on. So we haven't seen the end of criteria. Uh, 2017 was an attempt to sort of shift the pendulum from too loose of a diagnosis of EDS. Unfortunately, it resulted in being more restrictive than, than it, I think it should be or more we, where we want it to be. And I think most uh, geneticists and other specialists in EDS uh, agree with that. But until we have a genetic marker or some other biologic marker, we're not going to have a perfect system, but we certainly uh, need to move in that direction. But, um, you know, 
it's a source of frustration to many individuals who come to see us where they're really trying to understand why, you know, some people told them they had EDS and some people told them they had hypermobility spectrum disorder. Uh, again, some people were taking a broader view and saying, yeah, well, this, this, is, this is EDS, or they just weren't aware of or, uh, you know, closely following their criteria. And again, other times, if you follow the criteria to the letter, then a number of patients are going to have HSD and not EDS. But we're all talking about the same thing, and I think we need to move forward and focus on what we do about it. Again, I'm, uh, unfortunately, there's no medication or treatment, and if somebody has a diagnosis of EDS or HSD, we're going to manage them the same way. We're going to manage the joint complications. That might be PT. That might be other interventions. If there's POTS, we're going to manage that how we manage POTS. If there's gastrointestinal issues, there's many things we can do there. If there's mast cell activation syndrome, we're going to manage that like we manage mast cell activation syndrome. So hopefully that helps uh, you to understand um, this difference or, or, or the significance of of EDS versus HSD. So again, those folks who have HSD, when I just talk about EDS, I, in my mind I'm talking about you too, but we'll, we'll make an effort to uh, be more inclusive.